I made that lady go to the office and get a copy of my birth certificate <laughs> and come back and show me <coughs> that my first name was Charles. Right. Yeah. And when I got home, I, I, you know, I, I confronted my mama. Right. I said, well, Ms. Robinson says my first name is Charles. I said, everybody called me Edward. I always known Edward. She said, yeah, it is Charles. It was Charles Edward. Uh -huh. <laughs> so you started going by Charles. Well, after that point, after it actually that. started switching over slowly, right, slowly. Right. Those kids that grew up with me, we still called me Edward for a couple more years, but eventually they all went to Charles. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, sorry to get started here. Um, basically, what, what these interviews are for, we're doing interviews in conjunction with the Roundhouse Museum. Mm -hmm. And it's basically, you know, kind of people's memories and the history of East Wilson. Mm -hmm. You know, what's occurred in that area, and you know, kind of, I guess, the, the city of Wilson in general also. Yeah. And so we get started, if you please just let us know, you know, state your name again for us, and give us a little bit, you know, if you know how your family ended up here in Wilson. Okay, well, okay, my name is Charles Edward Davis, mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I was born and raised on what's called Daniel's Hill. I don't know if you've heard about that in your interview, so. We have. Yes. You, did you talk to Lewis Neal? Yes, we did. Okay, good. <laughs> but, but I'm not quite sure where Daniels Hill was. It's okay. right off of High Street, mm -hmm. the two blocks between Daniels and Warner. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Fake bordering Hines. We, we didn't live on the other side of Hines. Mm -hmm. We lived on the side of the railroad track. Right, oh, okay. And it went all the way back from there to the railroad track. There used to be a ball diamond back there. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And then it was a road that took you around by the trussel down there that was called Grab Neck. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And all of that area was black, kind of totally sitting there surrounded by a white community. Right. Okay. Okay. And, and that was kind of always the uniqueness about Daniel Hill. Here, this little six block, eight block area right in the middle of the white settlement. Mm -hmm. And of course, that also led to a lot of things when we were going to school and coming up because you always had to walk through the white settlements to get it where you had to go. Right. So, right. there were some rock throw-ins and some name calling that you ran a lot of times uh, through, through, through certain area neighborhoods <laughs> when you had to go downtown or you are going to school and whatnot. Uh -huh. So, you know, that was kind of a unique area. But my family, how, how they got it then, you know, of course, my father and my mother all came from out here in uh, Wayne County, uh, out toward Fremont, that area. Uh -huh. And... I can't really tell you all the circumstances of their, how they met, but uh, I can tell you that my mother and her sister married brothers. And, um, but then my mother and father moved to Wilson and they decided that they, when they started their family, they moved to Daniel Hill. And because my daddy worked at Central Brick Warehouse uh -huh. and my mother worked at the export factory. Uh, there were 12 kids in my family. Wow. Um, out of the 12, four of us were albino. Uh -huh. now, I have an older brother who's, I guess, 80, 83 now. His name is Richard, uh, who, who, who was the first, probably the first albino in Wilson, mm -hmm. or at least to my knowledge, anyway. He had some kind of unique experiences. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and of course, it was very tough on my mother. Mm -hmm. Very tough because there were all kinds of false claims about her, about her sleeping with white men. Oh, and, really? And, and, and then, yeah. they, you know, some kind of disease and okay. all kinds of crazy stuff that people have about albinism because they just don't understand that it's, it's an inherent, right. inherent hereditary uh, uh, condition. Right. And both parents have to have the condition in order for it to happen. Uh -huh. And that's something most people don't know. Right. Very, and, and, and in fact, uh, uh, my son, who's also albino, wrote a paper about it. And that's kind of unusual for an albino to have an albino child. Uh -huh. But I did. So it's a recessive gene. Yeah, it's a recessive gene. And both parents. And, um, and, and, and my mother, of course, by having four out of two, it was a little bit above the norm of 25% chance. Right. So, no big deal though. You live with it. Right. <laughs> but <clears throat> life in Wilson was what it was. And, and, and back in those days with 12 kids <laughs> living on Daniel Hill, and of course you lived in a relatively small wooden house. Uh, I can remember when they put electricity in when I was a very, very little kid. Yeah. I was real young. And I remember when they put our first inside bathroom in. Uh -huh. um, because when I was born, the first about three or four years, we had to go up on the hill and go to the bathroom. Hmm. Uh, 
our houses, as they call them. Oh, yeah. Which meant you had slop jars in your house. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So I'm sure that uh, none of this is new. How big was the house that you grew up in? <clears throat> uh, let's see, there was one, two, it was a two living room, two, two, two bedrooms, I'm sorry. What we called a living room, which was a living room, bedroom combination, and the kitchen. Mm -hmm. That was, there were 12 kids at one time in the house. Yes. So you slept together. And, and probably accounts for the fact that my family enjoys privacy so much. Oh, yeah. um, because coming up, we were all, you were always kind of <laughs> right. on top of somebody, always <laughs> yeah. in the same room with somebody, very little privacy. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, you just, but you learn to live with it. And, and, you know, it wasn't bad. I mean, you know, for sure, as poor as we were, and we were poor, we were not in the of the poorest mm. in our neighborhoods. Mm. So I never thought coming up that I was really poor because my mother always made sure that we were clean, that our clothes were clean and ironed, and that we were fed. And she did that mostly by, of course, she worked in the tobacco factories three, four months a year. Uh, and then she was always working in, in white folks' kitchens and houses, cleaning up and cooking, whatever uh -huh. case may be, uh, uh, during the other time. And, you know, that's how we survived. And of course, being economical, she was very economical. <laughs> yeah. you know, when the yeah. letter sent you to the store and she said, bring back a pound of beef stew or something like that, you yeah. know, when you went to the store, it had to be right. Yeah. And when you went back to the store right. again. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that, that all of us as children learn coming up is, is um, um, the, the whole idea of doing stuff right the first time, uh -huh. uh, of making sure that you got what you asked for, what you paid for. And if it wasn't right, you take it back. Mm. And you get your money back, or you tell them to fix it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so coming up on Daniel Hill, of course, was uh, kind of unique in, in the sense that because it was that small community surrounded totally by whites, you know, people were kind of tight, you know, they looked out for each other. And, the community helped raise the kids. I mean, it wasn't nothing if I was doing something wrong. Some lady beat my butt, you know, and then sent me home for another one. You know, you know about it before you got. There. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> believe back on that, but see, because she's working in the factory and at these folks' houses, sometimes it'd be four or five hours later before she get home. Uh, okay. But you can bet your bottom dollar she knew about it. You know about it. And and you lined up. <laughs> so you know, it was it was it was a. Uh, it was it was not a, a a bad upbringing, you know. Contrary to what a lot of people think that when you're poor and, and you live in conditions like that, that somehow or other that automatically leads you to uh, a crime or it leads you to uh, being, uh, let's say, not educated or, mm -hmm. or somehow or other uh, mischievous and that kind of stuff. That wasn't the case at all. Mm -hmm. uh, Daniel Hill, for me and for us, well, was a very very good community. Because the people looked out for one another so much, you know, you, you didn't have a lot, what little bit you had, you shared. And anybody in that community, they were at our house when we got ready to eat dinner. Yeah. They sat down and ate dinner, yeah. you know. And there were lots of kids that had a lot less than us, and we didn't have that much. <laughs> so it was it was a good upbringing for me. And, and, and of course, I went to public school. Now, we had to walk to Elvis Street School. Mm -hmm. That's uh, a distance from there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And, and of course, you develop all these different routes that you go depending on what the political climate was. Wow. Like we used to walk up Broad Street, uh, down to Bond Street, we didn't go down Bond Street, but that meant we had to walk past the white fence. Right. We got rocked sometimes, we walked past the white fence. Uh -huh. uh, white kids, you lay for you, throw rocks and stuff at you, call your names, that kind of stuff. But you know, that was a part of what it was about. You know? right. Right. And uh, so you develop other routes uh, to school. You, you develop ways to avoid that area if you mm -hmm. could and, and, and other shortcuts. And one of the ways that we used to go is, I don't know if you remember the Easy Monday factory that used to be here, mm -hmm. sat at the corner of Hines and Large Street. Okay. Well, we used to go straight down Hines Street. Right. And uh, the, the big thing going down Hines Street was that it was a dog up there on the corner. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I mean, it's just the way it was, you know. <laughs> so you learn how to sneak past the dog or 
wouldn't have grew big enough that the dog, if he came out there, you had enough protection. Right. But um, <clears throat> the funny part, the, the part about that was, when we went that way, we cut over by where Adam's school is now, mm -hmm. and then we crossed the railroad track. Uh -huh. And that down there, if you know, that's where the train, uh, Atlantic Coast Line and, 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 and Seaboard, yeah. that's where they, the working tracks were. Mm -hmm. So there was about eight, nine tracks mm -hmm. right in there that we had to go across and over and under trains if the trains were sitting there. Oh, and man. Uh, that kind of stuff. Oh, I mean, there have been many occasions where you go on a train and start to move and all that stuff. <laughs> all right. You know, so we, we had to do that and take a shortcut to get to Elmer Street. <clears throat> uh, a lot of, especially if you were running late. But but sometimes you did it just because you just wanted to get there and be through with it. Yeah. Uh, so that was that was kind of some of the yeah. stuff and obstacles that we we kind of did with. There were no buses in the place. You lived in the city. There's no school buses, no matter how far you live from the school. Uh -huh. How long it take you to walk there every day? Oh uh, well, it depends. If you walked, probably about mm, half an hour. Half an hour. Mm. If you ran like we did most of the time, <laughs> we were talking about. 15 minutes, 12, 15. We used to have a contest coming, especially coming home from school, yeah. to see who get home the fastest. Right. So you you just about run that whole distance in about 12, 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, and then of course coming back home, you had the old uh, mellow ice cream plant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, we used to stop by there on the way home from school every day. And, Go in the back and raid their throw <laughs> <laughs> You know, I mean, these are things the kids did. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And the banana plant, the, the fruit company that used to be right there on that corner of Goldsboro and uh, Hines. Yeah. <clears throat> We'd go by and see what they had in the borough. Sometimes they throw away bags of apples and bananas and huh. stuff, and some were bad, some were good. Right. And, you know, you, you raided that and just take it on down the street with you. So we always into something. I mean, it was something, that, and, 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 uh, you know, just a part of. Yeah. What kids do. That's and, right. Uh, uh, so, we lived on, um, uh, um, and the guy stopped me anytime time you got a yeah. question. You know? Well, you said uh, that uh, the route you took depended on the political situation. Well, so, yeah. if the political situation changed, did you have to change your route? The, yeah. And what was that? Well, when I say political situation, I'm yeah, talking yeah. about mostly us and, and, and mostly trying to avoid dealing with white kids. Right. Uh -huh. right. So it's depending yeah. on which white kids were being jerks. Right. Or, yeah. or which one was throwing rocks at us. Right. <laughs> or, or chasing us. Yeah. Uh, and, and how old they were, you know. Oh, yeah. You yeah. know, that, that, yeah. that, that made a difference. Yes. And, uh, that's right. not to say we didn't do some throwing and some jerking too. Yeah, that's correct. Right, yeah. We're not we're not saying that. I'm just saying though that most of the time we were on the run. Because yeah. we had to go through their neighborhood. Right. They didn't have to come into our neighborhood. In fact, they didn't come in our neighborhood. That was almost uh, uh the only time white folk came on Danny Hill was when they, they went for a purpose. Mm -hmm. Bringing somebody home from work. Mm -hmm. Or uh, there were times on like, like a weekend sometime when those those kids who were older who were well off enough to have a car come flying through the streets or something sometimes you know and all the streets were dirt mm -hmm. no paved streets uh -huh. on that hill at that time um, all dirt streets so it was dusty yeah and uh, but again you know you didn't care especially but sometimes it was good because you walk around barefoot most of the time. Yeah, it was yeah. so hot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Not so, like it was when I moved across town. Yeah. So too, I guess whenever y'all had to go go shopping, you had to go back to these same communities. Yeah, too. yeah, yeah, yeah. But Saturdays wasn't too bad because the kids, Saturday they were doing other things. You know what I mean? They were probably at the wreck or something. So Saturday wasn't too bad. And, and like for me, I was kind of like the bill payer. And, uh, different uh, coming up in my family. <clears throat> As you aged up, you took different responsibilities because my father died when we were uh, when I was six. Mm. Right, my baby sister was about two years old uh -huh. when he died. He had a, they said ulcerative stomach problem, cancer. Uh -huh. um, but he died, so Mama had to raise all the kids by herself. Uh -huh. So we had to, of course, assume responsibilities at home. Uh -huh. and, and again, that helped. I think it still some of that uh, uh, thing about taking care of business kind of kind of approach and attitude about things because yeah. you had to you know you started out first of all you make up your bed hang up your clothes sweep up your room dust your room I mean, that's kind of, one of the first thing you started learning coming up uh -huh. how to make fires because back in those days uh, 
And we had to get up in the morning. Someone had to get up in the morning and make a fire. Mm -hmm. And boy, that was cold. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that the house that we live in at night, sometimes when you wake up in the morning, now um, you, you, you glass of water beside your bed be frozen. Oh, goodness. So you uh -huh. slept on the quilts a lot. You know, uh -huh. Uh -huh. But but you learn in each year as you progressed, <clears throat> you, you learn more responsibility. Now, I moved off of Daniel Hill when we were in the fifth grade, when I was in the fifth grade. Uh, uh, my mother found a house over on Carolina Street, okay. uh, Carolyn, Carolina. Mm -hmm. House is still there. Surprise, surprise. I was going to say, is the other house still there on Daniel Hill? Oh, no, 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 no. So Daniel Hill, uh -huh. uh, right as we were moving off of Daniel uh -huh. Hill, the city had concocted a plan to redevelop that area. Mm -hmm. so that's all those newer houses are over there. Yes, okay. yes. Okay. And the idea at the time they developed that plan yeah. was to move the blacks from that area, mm -hmm. let that become an all-white area. Mm -hmm. now, that at least that's what we were understood it to right. be. Right. They wanted to make that deal. Wanted to get us out of the middle of the white community because tensions were growing. You, you, you could tell that. About when was that? This was in 1958. Oh. Uh, it's when we moved. Uh -huh. and, and you could already tell tension was getting higher between the races over that area. Uh -huh. And so when the city concocted this idea, of course, you know, I don't own nothing over there, so it didn't mean nothing to me. And the young as I was, right. other than the fact that it meant a lot to the people who lived on Daniel Hill, they, they, they resented it. Uh -huh. uh, because in order for them to re redevelop that area, everybody had to move off, right? mm -hmm. had to move out. Yeah. And then they went in and totally redid some of the streets and put in paved areas. And I'm, I'm sure Lewis probably shared with you the story of that Stewart. I don't think. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Tell me. All right. All right. Well, mm -hmm. when we were coming up, I'm not living on Daniel Hill. There were two what I would call. Black grocery stores. There's probably a couple of other little smaller stores, but Best Stewart and Jesse Stewart. Uh -huh. um, uh, Mr. Best Stewart had, had the biggest store in, for the blacks uh, right at the corner of Spruce and Bruton Street. And Mr. Jesse Stewart had a store right up the street. Mm -hmm. Now, Mr. Lord Slaughter had a smaller store down by the baseball down by the on Daniel Street. Uh -huh. I mean, on Warren Street. And uh, a couple other people had smaller stores up there, but they were real small. But uh, Mr. Mr. Best Stewart, by far, was the most prominent, uh, probably, in terms of, of, of blacks on Daniel Hill, uh, was probably the most prominent. He was the most entrepreneurial. He, he built his business up, his brick mason. Um, he built his own businesses up. He built his houses, his, his stores. His, he even built us a restaurant the first time we ever had a restaurant huh. on Daniel Hill. Huh. Um, and, and he owned a lot of property all the way back from where his store was, all the way back to the railroad track, a big chunk of property. Uh, uh, and that became real significant because after they finally got the money to do redevelop Daniel Hill, yeah. and they forced everybody to move off, the last obstacle that they had in their way was the fact that Mr. Best Stewart would not sell his property. Uh -huh. So they wound up having to take him to court. Hmm. And, you know, I, I guess they really thought, well, you know, he, he's not going to fight it, you know, you know, the city and all this stuff. Well, he did. Uh -huh. And what came out of that as an end result was that the courts told him, yes, you must sell your property mm -hmm. through eminent domain, but the city must then give you the first right of refusal right. to buy a lot. Hmm. That's why that area is, is all black now. Mm -hmm. huh. Because he then he sold his property, but he bought the first lot in the redeveloped area. Oh, okay. And he talked Lewis Neal yeah. into buying the second lot. Oh, okay. We did hear part of this story. Partially, yeah. yeah. And 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 you see that's how then well once yeah. two blacks bought property, whites wouldn't buy it. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of the same people so, who moved off of Daniel Hill, they eventually moved back on Daniel Hill. Still new houses. <laughs> in the new nice brick houses <laughs> now, you know. So 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 they kind of all what they did is they, they helped the people out over there a lot. And, but you know, it was it was just the way they went about it that, that made the people over there mad. Uh, 
Yeah. And, uh, uh, but but that's kind of what happened. And Lewis has a lot more information on that. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. Did you see the museum he had? <coughs> yeah, he took us on a tour. Okay. Of, yeah. of the museum is pretty yeah. amazing. Yeah. He, he he knows yeah. a lot of stories uh, <laughs> about things that he's not a fool about. Yeah, uh, documenting it all. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Daniel Hill then. Since it was kind of an island surrounded by uh, all whites, all whites mm -hmm. uh, kind of hostile whites a lot of times. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it sounds like you built a really tight knit, supportive community, and it, it like it was kind of kind of forced. Well, to, it was. I mean, survival. you know, when you're in a hostile environment, you kind of tend to pull together. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's kind of like family, you know. That's right. Even if we fight, you can't fight us. Exactly. Right. <laughs> you right. know, it's family, everybody. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And but, and, and then, then we had this um, dream of integration, <laughs> that, <laughs> or we could say desegregation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah. integration yeah. maybe yeah. maybe hadn't happened yet. Well, it had not yet. This this is when I moved across town. It was fifty eight, and uh -huh. I was in the fifth grade. Uh, and I went to Sam Lake School, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, which was much closer to my house than the other street was, mm -hmm. about a matter of blocks. So I was happy about that. Yeah, uh, I'm still late every day, but I was happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> you have to run as far as yeah, got even worse when I went to Darton because I lived a block and a half from Darton's front door. I was still late every day. <laughs> and just, just stuff. But, but uh, when we. Um, uh, moved across town uh, yeah. to Carol, Carolina Street, and I started going to San Luis School. And of course, you know that, that 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 everywhere I went, for me in particular, there were issues being out there. Uh -huh. uh, 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 kids picking at you. Uh, you always got a couple of bullies that want to just try you because you look different. Mm -hmm. from yeah. And uh, fortunately, I think that I, I, to this day, I thank God. You know, I was intelligent enough that I was able to, from an intellectual standpoint, deal with a lot of that. And, and it wasn't the issue of my intelligence or my ability or anything. You know, somebody's going to pick at me, they just picked at me because I was. I don't know. Okay. Nothing I can do about that. Yeah. You know, that's going to happen. Um, but as we moved across town, uh, you began to, to, to hear more about the civil rights movement. Uh -huh. um, you began to see it on TV. We got a TV, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and um, you know, so you watch the news and, and you see stuff that's going on in different other areas in the country, especially in Mississippi, Alabama, and those areas where yeah. things are starting to heat up. And and you could feel the tension here at home, right? Now, one of the things about Wilson that I I, I will say is this: Wilson was, was to me, I consider Wilson kind of a practical city, mm -hmm. um, um, and, and still is. To a great extent, and that is, it, it didn't. It didn't really seem to like extremes. My impression of Wilson is it doesn't like extremes. Yeah, it kind of likes that middle of the road. Right. Uh, I'm going to take some, and I'm going to take more than you give, but I'm going to give you a little bit too. Right. And, and that was kind of always the way I saw white black relations in Wilson. Mm -hmm. um, that, that that they they took more, but they gave us. Excuse me, I'm just like we got it worse. Okay.